if there's anything that you could give the people at home to improve upon their, their sales cycle, what would it be? One that comes to mind is like, you're either co- closing or getting closed. There is no in between. And once you start thinking like, oh, this person's like, oh, let me think about it. I'll get back to you next week. They're, they're not like, and that's the mistake I see in beginners and advanced closers is letting people sell them on things that make you feel good. What what does not feel good is typically the thing that's right. So when someone's like, oh, I'm going to think about it and get back to you, they're usually not thinking about it. It doesn't, thinking's instantaneous. So when they're saying that, it makes you feel good. But what you ultimately should want to hear is either someone saying, no, I don't like your program or yes, I'm in. I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of shit come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to rise up just so they could see me. Did what I had to do just to feed me. And what was left over, I put towards my dreaming. But the only thing in life that has meaning are the things you gotta work for, believe me. Take into your hands a plan, your own hands can land your own brand and damn. I feel like no one takes accountability. They want the credibility, convincingly unwilling to put in the Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I've got a uh, very special guest today, someone that has actually been an integral role in my journey thus far in business, and I won't uh, ruin the introduction. I will let him introduce himself. Gentry Chisita, welcome. It's um, it's a pleasure, man. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, do you want to give everyone a little bit of an introduction as to who you are, what you do, and um, I guess what your journey this this far in business has been? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Gentry Chittister. Uh, currently, I'm the CEO of Elite Closers, which is a sales training and recruiting company for uh, high ticket businesses. Before that, um, I was actually. I had gotten into high ticket remote sales and I had started selling a a high ticket online fitness program. And if you're not familiar with like what high ticket means, it typically means you're selling something that's a thousand dollars or more. And then um, that's where me and, you know, Mr. Livingstone connected in terms of, I had then transitioned uh, into selling high ticket coaching or teaching uh, online entrepreneurs uh, specifically online health coaches, how to create an online high ticket business. So my brother and I, we had scaled a, uh, online fitness business to over, you know, $5 million. So other fitness trainers and coaches started asking us, you know, like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Like, what's the secret sauce? And so it was kind of natural progression. Um, so now at this point I had done, you know, over 10,000 live consultation calls. And that's when now businesses started asking me to, to sell for them or like, Hey, can you help me with my sales team? So I transitioned out of just doing full-time sales to now, uh, running my own company, elite closers that is still in partnership with elite CEOs. And, um, it's been an incredible journey, you know, six years going strong now, which is crazy as like, it feels like just yesterday we got started. Um, and high ticket seems like so normal to me because I've been doing it so long, but still for people that I meet like every day, they're like, what? Like you, you sold a fitness program for like $3,800. Like no way. But, <laughs> um, absolutely. And it's, it's life changing. Like it, what I love about high ticket, obviously we'll probably get into this a little bit more, but it's just like the average person. It, it, it's kind of like what, what evens out the average person versus like your Kim Kardashian mm-hmm. or like, you're like, you know, um, keto body mm-hmm. type people who have a hundred million followers on Instagram or social media, just like the likelihood of you getting that type of following is like zero to none. So it, it helps you even it out first going for quantity. You just go for quality and, and evens it out. But that's, yeah, a little bit of background where I've been. I think it's one of those, uh, it's a very unique uh, culture shock, especially here for in Australia, like high ticket closing is not, it's not common. Um, and there is a lot of, I guess, not even, it's not even sales resistance from a buyer's perspective. It's sales Thank resistance you, from no, the I'm, people I'm, making I'm the sales. super excited to be and here. I'm, that making I'm that excited shift that we can reconnect. initially for like us was, it was a big, is, um, is like connecting with someone I, I, and I then guess a big challenge to the ego of like, no, okay, this is possible. Later, so I'm, you need I'm to remove what you believe. And I just want to give everyone a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a context and we can reverse engineer back from here. What's the single biggest sale you've done in one transaction? 
so my biggest sell year today is a quarter of a, a million dollars to so $250,000 on like a year long coaching program that I've done over the phone, like got on chatted for, or I wouldn't say chatted. It's not chatting. So, yeah. you know, got on the closing call for an hour and then, you know, processed the payment or got the process started, I should say. And the rest is kind of history. Amazing. And I'm assuming, like you said at the beginning, anything that is over a thousand dollars is classed as high ticket sales. So you started from the bottom and worked your way up to there. Let's um let's maybe reverse engineer some of the skill sets that came with that and we can address along the way like why you think maybe high ticket is a, a better option for for coaches out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in terms of reverse engineering, just starting with like some of the skills I think it takes to Yeah. Well let's let's maybe let's start with like what kind of mindset do you need to have or what sort of relation what sort of relationship do you feel like is necessary to have with money to move into that sort of sales process? Yeah. So I shared this story a few times, but it's like it's so true. I so I grew up in a big family, like one of seven kids. My dad's a teacher. My mom didn't work. So like I I I did not come from money. And I think some people get confused and, and think I did or something, but I did it. My dad worked, you know, multiple jobs. One of his jobs was like power washing. So we would go to people's houses, knock on their door, and like, hey, we'll charge you $250 to power wash your driveway. So at a very young age, I kind of got introduced to like selling and we were doing odd jobs to to help the family um, have ends meet, if if you will. And so um, I, yeah, I came up in like a big family and, and we didn't have a lot of money. And so this is kind of a interesting thing, but anytime I would get clothes or like we would go shopping, we'd go to like the thrift stores or we would go to like the, the stores that I was like, you have the brand clothes, but they haven't been bought. So it's like the seat, like you're in summer, you're getting like the fall stuff. And in winter, yeah. you're getting this, the summer stuff. So that being said, the most I had ever paid for like a t-shirt at that time was like $50. Like even until I was like 18 years old, like I, I never went to the mall or, or like big shopping centers. And then when I turned, when I turned 20, I had gone to a mall and I was still very, very broke. Like didn't have any money yet. Like how do you, how to even uh, technically started high ticket sales yet. And I saw someone pay $6,000 for a Louis Vuitton jacket. And I was like, $6,000. Like I couldn't believe it. And then I started looking and there were shoes that were like $12,000. There was like this like shirt. It had like holes in it and stuff that was like $8,000. And I was just like, and I was watching people buy it. And that was like, that moment in time, I I can I remember it like it was yesterday. I just remember being like, dude, if people are spending twelve thousand dollars on shoes, then like selling health and wellness, like just even health and wellness, like I could charge at like three thousand because I I'm I was like most people. Uh, my brother had approached me and was like, dude, it's high ticket, like it works. I know it seems crazy, and I was like, bro, like you can get a gym pass for like fifty bucks, like it doesn't even make sense. But then I saw that and I just realized like people will spend money on whatever, obviously like they see value in and ultimately like you get whatever price tag you put on something, people will pay if they want it. Mm -hmm. So once I saw that, that's where like my money was like, oh dude, like 3000 isn't that much. And I still go back to that. Like one of my Mm -hmm. hacks for if you're feeling like people aren't buying because it's a lot of money is go to expensive places around your house or wherever you live, like depending on where you're at and watch people spend money, like watch how much money they'll spend. I actually just had an event in Miami, Florida, and I I went uh, out to eat with some friends and it was a hundred dollars like per person just to get in the door, not even to like get any food. Just to get a drink of water. I was sitting there and I was just watching all these people come in that like, obviously I don't know them. I don't know their story, but I was like, there is no way there's that many people to have just like that much money just sitting around, like mm. able to just throw it around. And so again, it's people will spend tons of money on food, drinks, pleasure, whatever it might be. So again, that's just what been one of my hacks, but like where my mindset with money just completely transformed and to this day is like, biggest life-changing kind of situation I have with money. Yeah. I had a very similar situation. Actually, um, I did a seminar like three days ago and one of the, the, 
the biggest examples that I can give in that that situation is something very similar. Um, I told tell everyone that I mentor when it comes to a relationship with money is just go read the Rob report. There are people spending five hundred thousand dollars on a pen, and if you don't think you're more worthwhile than a pen, like there's something very very wrong. Yep, a hundred percent. I couldn't agree with that anymore. And what, what uh, was that? You tell them to read what? The Rob report. It's literally just a. Uh, it's pretty much just a place where people put up crazy expensive chairs, and you see what people have bought and what people have paid for for just inanimate objects, and it's unbelievable. Um, the amount of cash flow that goes through these type of places, and it's insane. Um, and you know, when you're talking to people that deliver service and deliver value through their skill set that they've developed and spent, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you know, not to mention the time. It's it becomes near impossible to actually disassociate from that value. Like, okay, maybe this makes a bit of sense now. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. What was your what was your first like, I guess, roadblock that you came across when it came to ro- like rolling into high ticket sales, learning the sales process? What would, do you think like were some of your biggest roadblocks? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, it's a good question. I think it just depends on like where and when you were at asking me um i think now that i've done so many calls or like so many consultations the biggest roadblock is and i think in sales just in general is the person who's selling like what you're just talking about like you have your mindset with money and then you are you showing up to the call like happy to be on the call right and sales isn't as easy as like just show up be happy smile and there you go but i believe that's like 50 percent of the battle right is if you show up in a good attitude you show up like ready to serve that's 50 percent of the battle right there and then i think in my early days even though you can understand you have value then it's believing that people have money right mm. there's still that really big belief where it's like oh that person's broke and i just don't believe that especially like I know in Australia, it's a little bit different, but like in the U S like there's a reason there's so much debt over here is because people buy things like they can't afford that. That's yeah. pretty, pretty common over here. So, um, I believe now, um, for me, it's still like myself, like I get in the way of, of mostly everything. When I was younger, it was like mindset that again, people had the money. I know people would spend it, but it was like, Oh, it's this person I'm talking to. Do they actually have it? Um, mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that can still, even when, you know, just like fitness, right? You get in good shape, but just because like you've gotten good shape, you have to maintain it, right? You have to keep mm-hmm. going to the gym. So the same way you break or get new mindsets, you still have to like train that mindset frequently to keep, keep the good mindset where it is. Yeah. What would you say? Like, I, I have a pretty strong belief system on this, but I'd, I'm curious to see your thoughts on it. What do you, what would you say to those that would uh, have the opinion that sales is underhanded or seedy or manipulative or forceful? Like, what would you say to people that have that sort of connotation to sales? Yeah, I mean, it, it can be. I, I would say so. Like, it can be. But that's where I believe, like, to be good at sales, you have to believe in what you're selling at the end of the day. And if you believe mm-hmm. that you're not going to have those thoughts about yourself, if you have those thoughts about yourself, um, you'll never sell. Now, if someone has those thoughts about you, it's more of probably how you're selling or how you're coming across. Mm-hmm. And I think it just has a sales can carry a negative connotation because there are bad salespeople in the world. I just like, you know, there are good people in the world, good salespeople, bad salespeople, like it, it's all the same. So I think anything you look at, right? Fast food, as an example, I was like, fast food's unhealthy, which technically isn't true. You can get healthy fast food, but it just has that connotation. So I I don't think sales is just seedy or manipulative, like Mm. more than anything else really. But I think it's just that one that's been highlighted because there can be some of that that goes on maybe more than, than other places. I think it also comes down to the type of sales you're going through, whether you're like, the, the, the further down the road of like feature-based sales you're going to go is the more desperate it becomes, the more money hungry rather than just trying to actually solve someone's problem. I heard a quote pretty recently. It was that the only difference between sales and manipulation is, is intention. And I think that kind of comes, kind of hits home pretty well. Uh, and yeah, if you go into any sort of sales process, and this is something I can say to yourself as well, that like being on the the receiving end of your sales process, it was solution oriented. It was, okay, well, what is the actual problem? Can I help you? And if I can, I'm going to sell to you like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I think too, like 
when when you have a feeling right it's kind of like what we're doing right now like reverse engineering it so i know at least right like in the states sales salesmen were believed right up until 2008 where like we had our huge you know crash our stock crashed right and like people started going having like massive issues in debts because what was happening is real estate agents and and loan officers and and people that owned um, brokerages were giving out loans that people couldn't afford, mm. right? But because money was flowing, they could do it at the time. And they were telling them, oh, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And then what happened is once the loans got called on and they couldn't pay them, that's where everyone's, you know, uh, uh, I, excuse me, that's where people started running into issues or that's where salespeople started losing trust, right? And so Buyer sophistication goes up each year. You know, there are, you know, scammy or slimy sales techniques that happen. So the more that happens over time, the more sophisticated the buyers get, the more they're kind of apprehensive to buy. And then the more sophisticated your sales process has to become. So you don't lean into that field for sure. Yeah, I agree. What's some of the, uh, what's some of the sophistications that you have made, some of the upgrades that you have made to your sales process over the years with all of this buyer's resistance? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you like two main things that I've noticed this like this year, 2023, is automated confirmations like do not work anymore. And then even manual text confirmations, a ton of my clients, like they're getting confirmations, but then the people are still not showing up. Mm. Right. So I've noticed that like the number one way to keep your no show rate down is like literally calling confirmations, like having someone on your team that calls people 24 hours in advance manually confirms with them can build some rapport and make the person excited for the call or at least like okay these, this isn't just going to be like another salesman trying trying to sell me something like right off the gate so yeah. that's one and then two is the way you you frame things like it used to be back 2015 2016 or excuse me 2017 2018 um you could be pretty harsh with like hey so here's how the call is going to work and i've noticed that buyers have heard that more and more and more so that when you're like hey here's how the call is going to work i'm going to do this you're going to do this and by the end i want a yes or no a lot of them are like no i've like i've been here before i've heard that before and that's the thing it's like oh i've heard that before already so what happens is a lot of things get regurgitated get recycled and so then people start hearing them so when you say it they're like oh like you're not authentic you're not real you're just saying what someone else has said mm -hmm. so my tip for that is to take the foundations of what someone's saying but you can say it in your own way or say it in a way that like you would speak. So it sounds authentic to what you're saying. I've been like the two biggest things I've seen shift in the industry, like this year alone, especially in the first couple of months. Yeah. I think we've, um, I've even seen that, seen that in our business is just like coming through with automation. We've, we implemented a lot of automation in the last six months, like more than ever. Um, and it worked really, really well. A lot of patent interrupt using a lot of humor in that automation worked really, really well, but there's been a bit more resistance to it of like even just like response rates down slower um and it's like and australia is generally somewhere that that kind of stuff like we kind of get at last we get the iterations and the the changes especially in sales and buys buying cycles um from talking to clients over in the us it our, we seem to be behind all the time but that's something that is consistent here too which is it's interesting um and the big thing is because AI, right? Like yeah. people are like, oh, this is say. a robot. Like they, they again, it's inauthentic. So the number one hit or like number one thing that I, I feel never dies is authenticity in sales and, and like personalization. Like yeah. if you can keep that human to human contact with all that's going on, that, that's the separating factor. I believe a, a big one right now. Yeah, I agree. With, um, with like shifting into a high ticket sales position, what do you think the strategical advantages are there? Mm, in terms of just like that position or in terms of like... Well, look, it, it comes with its undeniable status. Like when you say a price point, it definitely comes with status and people start to assume you're already worth more. But let's say from a cash flow perspective, um, even looking at like over LTVs and like client lifespans, like what do you see the... I guess the question I'm asking, why should people shift to a high ticket model? Just because it's the safest, right? And and that I'm, I mean, at the same time, safest is not always better, but it's it's the best for someone starting out in business or wanting to be cash flow positive, right? Because mm -hmm. the way it works, if you're doing marketing, if you're spending, we'll just say money on content, right? 
So you spend a thousand dollars on content and you're selling a hundred dollar item. You need 10 people to buy, right? Well, if I'm, if I spend a thousand dollars on content and I'm selling a $2,000 item, I need one person to buy and I still make a thousand dollars more than you. Mm -hmm. And when you have, let's say a small following or a following that's not very engaging, what's easier to get 10 buyers or one buyer, right? So it helps you stay in a safe zone where you can get money back very quickly. And then you're not having to stress and and be on very, very thin margins. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've noticed a lot. I've been doing, you know, a lot of work with really big businesses and a lot of big businesses run you know, on investments or, or angel investors, things like that. They don't really run off of cash in the bank. Yeah, yeah. But when you're starting, you know, typically a service-based business where you don't have tons of investors and you don't have a ton of financial backing, you need to be cash flow positive. So the quickest way to get positive is high ticket. Mm. And then on top of that, again, it allows you to make more and have higher quality versus just having thousands and thousands of things to worry about, which you know, those two things alone, I, you know, pretty like black and white for me. And it's always been like, yeah, that's why everyone should do it. Like, uh, yeah. that's what I believe. We, um, I probably, I'm just going to ask a probably more of a bit of a selfish question just to, for your own, your own insight. We, um, we shifted to a high ticket model really successfully, really well. Um, and we had like a over, I think it was like 87, 87% conversion rate on, on those calls. The problem we found though was, after that high ticket investment, it was a 12 week paid in full that the re-sign rate into a reoccurring model was far less. And that started to actually implement impact our LTV pretty aggressively because we were normally keeping people for up to 18 months within the business. Um, but then when we went to that high ticket, their sales resistance and their, I guess their spending resistance after that period of time reduced. And when we tried to get them onto a reoccurring model, it dropped. So what I ended up shifting to was like a front loaded, not paid in full, but front loaded, liquidate the transaction, liquidate the cost of essentially the service, what I pay my coaches, what I pay my team in that first transaction, and then moved them into a reoccurring model faster. Um, do you see the, do you see a benefit in going high ticket that maybe not so much a benefit do you see some sort of strategic strategical advantage going that way high ticket and then having to resell at the end or better to just have some the one sales cycle and automate that process into an upsell where it's like reoccurring yeah it's a, it's a really good question i mean and i don't i don't know your whole back end but typically on a high ticket the kpi that you're typically looking for is like minimum 30 percent resign rate yeah right um, so every three out of 10 people, that's at a minimum. Now I do have clients who are all the way at a 70% resign rate on their, you know, back end mm-hmm. um product or their back end program, whatever it may be. A lot of that comes down, and this is again, when we talk about sales, like there's so many different types of sales, right? But if if we're talking about okay, so you get a front end customer and then we want them to continue on our continuation program or upgrade program that sell starts from day one. And that's mm-hmm. where I see the biggest mistake in people trying to get more LTV is they let someone go through a 12 week program. They'd say nothing about like ongoing continuation, maintenance, anything. Mm-hmm. And then they get to 12 weeks like, oh, by the way, you need to continue. And then the person's like, oh, I was thinking at 12 weeks I was done. Mm-hmm. So what, what's this? And then they get hit with another big price tag and it throws them off. So if you're someone who's struggling with having continuation, it means you're not planting enough seeds during the process. And then the other big tip that I can give someone is you don't wait till the end of the program to upgrade someone. When they have their biggest win, that's when you upgrade them and have them sign on to the continuation package. And Mm -hmm. I've done that sometimes when people are in week two. So they come on, they're in it with me for a week, second week, they have a huge win. I'm like, hey, dude, I think you should continue on. And so you've already signed up for this, but this will just hit on this date and we continue on. And they have all the adrenaline, all the momentum is working in my favor. It's yeah. not, they get to the end and then, oh, hopefully they, they want to keep going. So if you do those two things, I really, again, I think it's something like you see just as good as LTV conversion or, L, uh, you know, lifetime value from a customer, high ticket, low ticket, if you set it up the right way. But the sales process is a little different from, you know, a smaller front end package for sure. Yeah. I think though, for everyone at home though, what that just highlights is if your attention is a struggle, you need to focus on your sales cycle, not when the, when the buying cycle finishes, but that's when the sales cycle really just is in the, in the, in the middle of the phase. Like you need to keep going. 
Yep. I, I, I couldn't agree anymore. Yeah, for sure. What's um? Let's kind of dive into because I'd love I'd love to dive into some of the success the success the success that you've experienced through elite closes and like what you've built and how you built it out. But I'd first like to touch on some of the strategies around sales that you find really helpful, so we can give some people at home a little bit of a, a take home tip, some some sort of framework that you feel is really really helpful. Yeah, I mean, so what I would say is, is being able to break your call down. If I could help people specifically in high ticket. Um, I've done over 12,000 consultations at all different price points with multiple different offers. Um, and that's one thing I, I love, right? It's, it's how we got connected, right? It's like, mm. uh, you're in Australia, I'm in the U S but we still connect. And that's, that's something I love about high ticket meeting people, hearing about all these different businesses, but a high ticket call should be an hour or less. Okay. Your pre-frame should be no more than five minutes and five minutes is like max, and then you have what's called your discovery and qualification. And that should be 15 minutes at the like least and then 30 minutes at the max. Then you move into like your summarization and transition. That should be about one to three minutes. And then you go into your pitch, right? So that's four parts of the call. Your pitch should then be between eight to 12 minutes. So if you total all that up, you're around 40, 35 to 40 minutes. And then you have what I call your lockdown phase, your temp check, and then your price drop and objection techniques, which will give you a total of eight sections of the call. You should be price dropping around 40 to 45 minutes. If you can stay within that time frame on your call, it's typically perfect. And that means you're asking enough questions, you're sharing enough value, and you'll have a good chance to close your call. If you're under that, you're not sharing enough value, you're not asking enough questions. And if you're over that, you're exhausting your client because people have buying energy, just like we have selling energy. So if you oversell by the end, you there's three things. There's fight, flight, or freeze. And most people don't know about that third one. So they get clients who they're like, I got to think about it. I got to think about it. And the person on the other line, the closer is like, oh, this person sucks. They're lying. But all that they, they don't realize, like, again, the closer is the problem that's put them in that freeze mode where like the person's so exhausted, they have nowhere to go. They, they literally are repeating themselves because they're frozen. They're mm-hmm. frozen from being their, all their energy being you know taken up by the closer. So I would say that's the number one or not. I wouldn't say number one, but it's one strategy that will, I see a lot of people break. Like they don't know what their, where their timing is or what their timing should be. They're kind of just shooting from their hip. Mm-hmm. So for people listening, that should be helpful on your closing calls if you're doing them and, and kind of help you in terms of the timeline. And then that's where you know you went wrong in your call. If you break those timelines, you can just, oh, that's where I went over on time or under on time. You'll miss something in there, guarantee you. And then you go back, fix that, you're gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think having like that reporting system as well, like taking the notes and knowing exactly where like in your your segments that you are. Um, Because like a lot of people, you know, I'm sure like myself, you have a sales team that record their calls and you can get feedback and you can look at that real t- real time uh, strategy play. But a lot of people doing sales on their own, they don't have that luxury. So how do you feel like, what do you feel like your suggestions would be to those that are doing sales on their own? How can they reflect back on their calls to get some data that is actually useful? I mean, I know it's, I know it's, it can be a little bit difficult, but most people don't watch their calls or listen to their calls back at all like that that is your game film like if because the story you tell yourself in in your head is usually different than what you'll hear actually happens on the phone you'll be like oh i I thought i sounded good but then you listen to it and you realize how boring you sound (laughs) or you'll just like how unenergetic you sound so it you can you can get an app in the app store it's ten dollars for a year-long subscription it's called tape a call t-a-p-e uh a and then c-a-l-l tape a call that's how I encourage like any entrepreneur that I work with. That's like doing everything, wearing all the hats, literally use that app. It's the simplest app. You can re- record all your calls and then just watch them back. That will make you like 10 times better on your calls. But most people don't do that there. I'll have people send me calls literally to get coached. They're like, Oh, I listened to it back. I thought it sounded great. I know they did it. We'll get on a call together. And I'll be like, you really listen to it. Back? They're like, oh, no. Like, Maybe I listened to the first 40 seconds on double time. Yeah. 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 So listen to your call back and that, that will really help. Yeah. I always try and like for my sales team, like 
we'll do we, we do like our sales reviews and we do all like the you know the traditional training like watch the game footage essentially but after every call they have to do one thing they like were horrible at one thing they did good and one thing to focus on the next time it's just that that like trifecta of three and rather than getting overwhelmed by me looking over their sales footage and going oh this is horrible like this part sucks this part sucks they just give them one thing and go yeah yeah and that's that's a bit other thing i try anyone i coach or anyone i give feedback to or even myself it's max of three things yeah so it's like one two three three things that i'll work on or get better i never do more than that i sometimes do less for sure like you're saying but if you try to improve way too much um it's it's gonna hurt you and that's why i break the call down it's like those eight sections is i'm like oh, okay i stunk on section one section two section three let's fix this in section one and two and then Mm. Try that, go to the next call, come back. If it sounds good, move to the next problems. Which of those eight do you feel is the most integral to get the sale? Obviously, they are all important and they all serve their purpose, but where do you feel like the sale is either uh, missed or landed? Yeah, uh, section two, the qualification and discovery. People will tell you how to sell them. Like it's, uh, yeah, that's, so I agree. It's agree. my favorite thing. Like Literally, people tell you how to sell them if you ask good enough questions and you listen. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes is active listening is listening to learn. It's not listening to hear. And that's what it's about is, is asking questions to learn what your customer wants. And most people don't do that. Again, they're, they get a script or they watch a YouTube video and they're like, oh, I'm not asked these questions. I don't know why I'm asking this question, but Gentry said to, mm. and that's another thing. Never ask a question that you don't know why you're asking because now any information the person gives you you don't know what that information is for so section number two that's where your calls are are won or lost if you can get that down the rest of your call is super super condensed and easy i think that active listening uh skill set is something that for myself i only really developed when i started podcasting i was like you know the ability to sit and listen especially with international guests like yourself where there's a potentially a bit of lag and it's like okay you can't ask things until someone finishes exactly what they want to say. Because I think one thing, especially like with sales, we, we especially less experienced salespeople, they kind of fall back into this road of con- like convincing and having to try and be the person saying all the things. And it kind of puts them in this position where to even put to your analogy, your timeline just gets thrown out of whack. You could spend the next 40 minutes trying to convince someone of someone you haven't even gotten them emotional yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's the truth. And, and I, I love that you said that because podcasting is one way to get, get better at active listening because it's, you know, situation where like you're having to play off the guest a little bit. So I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. What's going on everyone? Hope you're well. I won't keep you too long. I know you're hopefully enjoying the podcast. And if you are, let us know. It would be really greatly appreciated if you can jump on, give us a quick five-star review. You don't even need to stop listening to the show. Uh, if you're on Spotify, you can do it in less than 10 seconds. And um, it does help the show grow a lot. It helps us you know, get a bit of confirmation bias that we're doing the right thing. And just to say thank you, if you guys do do that, uh, we're going to be picking one person every month to guess what on the podcast that has shared, liked, comment, subscribed, and, and interacted with what we do. Big thank you. Let's get back to it. Do you, um, have you, like, I know for yourself, like, at least I've noticed you've been trying to really build your personal brand lately. Have you been trying to get on a few more podcasts of late? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've gotten on quite a few, I, I feel like, um, which is a lot of fun. I, I love doing stuff like this. Yeah. I think that personal brand element as well, like for people starting their own entrepreneurial journey, like even going into sales, like keeping on topic, if you don't have that no like trust factor as a personal level, even, or even if we push this up to a brand level that are outsourcing sales, that branding is something that's still crucial and part of the sales process, in my opinion. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree and, and and disagree. Like in context, I've been in the game for six years and I just started building like my personal brand, if you will. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think the goal behind building my personal brand um, is is ultimately to get connected with more entrepreneurs, do more more stuff like this, and then ultimately. If you're trying just not not to sound arrogant or anything like that, but if you really want to build something to a billion dollars, like you have to have a personal brand, right? Like okay. Conor McGregor is my one of my favorite examples. Mm-hmm. Conor McGregor, no one knows him. He builds a personal brand through the UFC, then creates a whiskey brand, and now it's billions of dollars. Right now, he can, you know, I, not that he couldn't do whatever he wanted before, but having a brand eventually can help you build something bigger. Um, but I think. In my opinion, a lot of people focus on building their personal brand before they have anything or have, yeah, I agree. have really 
built something. So in context, yeah, I'm absolutely working on the personal brand, but I, it's been six years before yeah. I started. I'll see people like, Oh, I got to build my brand. I got to get my Instagram up. It's like, I had zero posts when I first started, like yeah. absolutely nothing. Um, that's changed in the last you know year or so, but yeah, I, I think it's important, but just in due time and, and know where you're at. Like if you're starting out and you're starting high ticket, you don't need a personal brand to start and be successful. If you're trying to build, you know, a whiskey brand or like a, a makeup brand or something like that. Yeah. It's way easier to do something like that with a personal brand. for Sure. I think that's really synonymous with what you mentioned before though, with like high ticket sales is heavy on cash flow. It's sorry. It's really positive for cash flow. Branding is not cash flow positive. Um, and that's where I see so many people, they, they break into this, like trying to make their Instagram feed look pretty, their content look curated, and they don't even have any clients to serve yet. And they have are trying to niche down or niche down into this world that they don't even exist in yet. Yeah. That's a, it's the craziest thing. And, and, uh, <laughs> one of my, one of my favorite things to share is like one of my, I would say top clients we're helping her with her sales team and, and setting team. And she gets like 160 calls booked in a week. Um, from the setting team and her content she's pregnant right now she gets on like instagram live and she looks rough like i tell her this too. I'm like, Dude, you look rough. like she'll get on she's like eating a salad like she's like i'm sorry i thought i'd make it but her content is on authentic and real yeah. and so she gets so much engagement and so kind of what you just said like the problem with people in content and and i personally have even fallen into this trap is like Content is about how it looks. It's about how it makes people feel. And one of the best advices I got when making content is like, dude, if you don't like it, no one else is going to to like what you're putting out. Agree. Um, so more important than like what it looks like is is really like how like how you feel about it, and then like honestly how real your message is. If you're just like saying something that you saw someone else, it doesn't land. Like I've I've seen that personally, and then I see it with clients that I work with as well. So it's it's an interesting it's weird because, you know, you kind of, you do fall into that trap, like being so worried about it. But in reality, it's, if you just post real stuff, it, it lands way better. Yeah, I agree. And I think like having that more long-term mindset that like the brand will come and like you can, you, you can use it in to, to influence sales, but it is not going to be the thing that gets reps on the board initially. Yeah. And that's, that's a mistake. I think some people fall into is thinking that the personal brand will influence sales it's it's kind of honestly kind of like a mindset trap that people fall into because like oh didn't you see my Instagram and then the person on the phone's like no, no. and like <laughs> you're <care>. arrogant <laughs> and like egotistical yeah. for saying that so screw you yeah so something that I think sometimes carries a little bit more weight especially for people who don't know as much than than it really really does overall yeah what are some of the other mistakes you feel like people make in either business in general or more specifically in sales. This is just a personal thing, but I think a lot of people get partners when they don't need one or they get a partner and their business is brand new and they don't know their partner. They don't understand their partner. They get a partner based off of like friendships versus like skill sets. So mm -hmm. I don't recommend partners. I think partners uh, make everything more difficult. I've seen very few actually be like fruitful in terms of business more than I've seen them kind of like things break apart, fall apart. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to get a partner, you need someone who's going to complement the skills that you lack. So for me, like if I was going to get a partner, I love sales, um, but I, I'm I'm sort of weak with like automation and the tech, right? Mm -hmm. That's like my weakness. So that's an example of like a partner I would go after. That's a very common mistake I see. And I think part of it though, is people who are starting or sometimes people who are newer, they they feel like they need someone to succeed. They're, they're not like yeah. 100% confident with their own skills uh and then i know we're talking about it but the i would say this is almost like the first mistake is people undersell themselves and undercharge for way too long um it's so funny to me man because i see i have a client who just came on who's sponsored by alpha elite half a million followers like her content's amazing like just great she like, has fantastic. a social awareness yeah and i can already tell oh, you yeah. this is going she's, she's been selling point. like a 400 dollar you know little program. And then I have another yeah. client who has 10,000 followers who's doing, you know, upwards of $80,000 a month selling a $4,200 program and, or like, you know, 10,000 followers, like not the and, greatest. And arguably content. doing it easier. Yeah. Doing it way easier. Not having to post, not having to shoot videos at the gym all the time, not worrying about like 
so much what she's wearing and those types of things, not having to get on Instagram stories all day long. So it's just interesting to see that, right? Like if you, if you put the pictures up and you're like, which one does better? Everyone's going to be like, Oh, like the one sponsored by Alpha Elite, but like the numbers don't yeah. lie. You know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. What would your, what would your advice be around people comparing their price point to others in the industry? Yeah. It's, it's a trap. Um, yeah. Cause I think that sums it up from what you said there. There's someone there that was like from a, an optics perspective, uh, you would you would assume they're more you know uh, financially successful and have better cash flow and so on and so forth. Uh, and if we make a comparison to that, that's the standard you'll set. Like, how do you feel like you break that trap? Yeah, well, and not to come across like contradictive, but I I, I teach a lot of time. Don't compare your pricing or your offer to someone who's super far ahead of you. Right. Mm -hmm. So I I was working with another coach that was pricing their program based off of something Tony Robbins was charging. I'm like, dude, come on. Like Tony Robbins has worked with Michael Jordan, like the Boston Celtics, like major, major people. Um, But you can base it like if, again, my alpha elite client, she's looking at this other client that I'm mentioning. They've been in the fitness industry about the same amount of time. You know, they both have the same credentials. So it's like, why is she charging 400? My other client's charging 4,200. She's charging, you know, 10 times more, like, and you have the same credentials. You've been in about the same length of time that there's something wrong with that picture. So I think you can look at people around you or people that I don't want to say like are super far ahead of you, but maybe people that, you know, like, Hey, I, I could be just as good as him. Or, or I think I have similar skills. And if they're charging three times, four times, five times more than you, you can probably get in that, that sphere. Mm. Um, if you're super scared though, I don't think it's bad to start a little lower if you have intentions of ramping up, right. And, and moving your price point up. But I, I really don't encourage anyone to start for less than 1200. So if you're listening to this, you're like, what if I have zero experience, never done anything, start at 1200. Once you get your first 10 clients, bump up to 15. Once you get in your next five, 10, you can bump up to 18 and then keep rolling from there. If you're someone who's like, tell me what to charge and do it. A lot of my clients start at 25. Um, in the fitness industry, if they're in mm. the real estate industries, th- different things, depending on what they're selling, it'll change. But yeah, I mean, just undercharging this makes me sad because there's just so much left on the table because it's not about the money they're making, but my clients who make more can usually do more in-person events with their clients. They can give better gifts to their clients, fly clients out for like private VIP days. So it just makes your service all around better in my opinion. Yeah. I think as well, like there's, there's beauty in what you said there with there is not a problem with charging a lower amount initially um, prov- provide it's for that for that confirmation bias to get the reps to to hit that target and as long as I in my opinion you set that target hard of once I hit X amount it goes up yeah yeah I that's that's the thing I was like having to plan to move it up that's yeah. where I see a lot of people fail yeah because you I'd assume you'd be on the same page that like to sell something well you need to have conviction in the in the actual service itself and believe in it yeah, yeah, you can't, you, you, a thousand percent, yeah, it's impossible to sell something you don't believe in because that's, someone can tell when you believe in something you're going to sell from a place with passion without even having to try versus like forcing it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And that's like, I, I, from what I experienced at least, like when you look at like selling, you know, B2B and trying to improve someone's ability to upskill and uh, charge more and so on, it's a product that you believed in wholeheartedly with elite CEOs. Uh, what's the what's the journey been for you? Obviously, you've worked with your brother. You've built your own uh, reputable you know, business on your own as well. So what's that journey been like for you? And let's talk to some of the success that you've seen over the last like five years. Yeah, man. I mean, it, it's been um, it's been life changing, and and I'm I I just feel very like blessed. You know, um, I feel like I was put on this earth to do, to do sales, coach people in sales, train people in sales. And, and I know it sounds a little like cliche or cheesy, but I really do. I love it. I love like, this is why I love it though, dude. Like, again, you're in Australia, I'm in the U S we didn't know each other at all. And then you booked a sales call and like, look at it now. Right. So it it's just literally, it's like so amazing to me. Um, but yeah, like you said, man, I, I started selling, uh, for my brother, 
uh, back 2018, um, when we were selling a, a fitness offer specifically, and then that moved into the coaching offer. And I sold for him for like three and a half, four years. And his, his price point, you know, ranged, uh, between all the way from, you know, $5,000 all the way he had up to a quarter of a million dollar package. Um, sold well over $35 million for him. And then I started selling for him and a few other companies and then started elite closers. Now elite closers started because the people I was selling into my brother's program who were getting coaching, building their businesses, their businesses really started to take off and do well, start making a hundred thousand, 200,000, $300,000 a Mm -hmm. month. So that, Hey, Gentry, like, do you want to sell for us? And then I actually started doing that. I was selling for five people at one time and I was like, this freaking sucks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was managing multiple calendars. I had like appointments at different times. People were texting me and it was like, oh, this is for, you know, John, this is for Adam. Like it it was just getting too much. So then I was like, dude, rather than me selling for everyone, why not build their own gentries? Like all all more me's. Um, And that's where Elite Closers, the company I'm running now, stem from. Um, And dude, I I love it because like now I get to say my genius zone of sales and, and help teams. I I will build either like a sales team for them or I'll build a messaging setting team for them that will help them pick up appointments. Yep. And that's that's for a little bit more advanced people. And you know, you have a sales team, right? But a lot of people are like, oh, I need a sales team to help me sell. And really what they need is a messaging team or a setting team that can help them get more appointments on the calendar and then bring on a sales team. Or they have so many appointments, they need sales guys to come on yep. or, or girls, you can get yep. one. Um, to come on and, and help them really relieve a lot of that pressure. And so, yeah, man, I mean, again, we've worked with some amazing people, amazing business owners. We have businesses doing more than hundred million dollars a year in their business. And so different levels, right? I work with entry level where they're doing, you know, $20,000 a month, 30. And then I have other businesses that are doing over a hundred million dollars a year. Um, so yeah, different levels and different needs, but it's, it's my you know passion. And so I'm very grateful that, it or organically happened. I didn't like have to force it. And that's not bad if someone starts something, you know, just out of the blue or hiding force it, but it was organically where people were asking me. And that's why I think it's been successful. That when people ask me, they're like, why, why do you think it's done so well or been successful? It's just like, it naturally happened. It kind of like organically grew. I didn't have to artificially like, you know, fake it or anything. It just, it happened because I had been in the industry and, and done well. And, people trusted me, which, you know, that's one thing in sales and people have heard it, but like your, your reputation, like you can ruin that with, with bad sales. And so if I had one like piece of advice to give the audience, if you suck at sales, it's not worth the line to get sales, like stay sucking, let your name, like let people at least know that you're a good person and your skills will get better over time. But we were talking about mistakes and not to go back to that, but that's another mistake I see a lot is people who suck at sales. They start overselling under delivering, or they start selling using bad techniques. And then it just mm. tarnishes the brand overall. I think that's something that actually, I look, this might be just anecdotal on my part, but I think that from all the businesses that I've worked with, it seems to be a natural progression at some point that uh, when the business starts to, I guess, overgrow their current capacity because maybe they're still working in the business, they're wearing all the hats, as you said before, that they start to overpromise and they can't fulfill on that 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 promise, and they start to underdeliver in the back end, and it it ends up being the bottleneck of the business in the long term. They've got great sales cycles, they've got great acquisition systems, but then the service lacks and they can't actually deliver purely because they're so busy. And that's, and that's where I, I would see, you know, elite closers fitting in perfectly when people are in that situation where service starts to lack due to, you know, the commitment of sales and needing to outsource. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And, and there's, there's a great book, um, by one, one of my good friends, his name is Ben McClellan and he has a partner named Jay and there is a book called, uh, the customer manifesto. And if, if you, if you're struggling with like fulfillment too, that's part of sales. And I don't think people understand that. Like you can be great on the phone and sell someone into a program, but if they mm-hmm. get into a program, it's nothing what you talked about on the phone, you're, you're in trouble. And that's chargeback rates going to be phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be just like terrible. And that's one thing in terms of sales that I've learned more over time 
is if you want to have a customer that signs on, stays with you longer, make sure the expectations, not not the features, but the expectations of timing, deliverables, communication time meets up with what's being said on the phone. Because when someone is is told a plan and the plan happens, they're thrilled. When mm-hmm. someone's told a plan and the plan doesn't happen, everyone goes goes absolutely crazy. Yeah, and I think that's really like, that's even on a sales call, it starts there with that framing, like that pre-frame of that call. If you don't do that well with a degree of authority where it's actually believable and you just start throwing things out there that we're going to do this, we're going to do this, uh, people are going to be pretty resistant from the beginning. Yes, like uh, incredibly resistant. But that, at the same time, if your pre-frame is too aggressive, because that's what I was going back to with like yeah. the market, they're just going to shut down and you've already, like I've seen people literally, the call starts, they pre-frame so aggressively um, because they got it from a book or they heard someone who's really, really good at sales. Mm. And I, I mean, I'm just giving all this, this free advice, man. So I hope, I hope uh, your listeners get value from it. But, um, the one, th- an- another thing that I just hate to see is people will hear me say something I've never done sales and then go try to do it. And yeah. that is like, it's, it's like walking, watching Michael Jordan dunk the basketball and be like, Oh, I'm going to go do that. But most people are, oh, I can't jump that high. But yeah. for some reason in sales, people will do that. They'll watch someone who's been in sales six years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, do an amazing, you know, objection handling, pre-frame, and they'll mm-hmm. go try to do it. And it's, it doesn't work that way. So with sales, the, the fastest way to get better is, is role play. It's yes. the suckiest, like most uncomfortable, but the best way to get better is role play with a partner, role play with like another sales rep that you can practice with. Second would be listening back to your calls, but yeah, I couldn't agree with you uh, and like any more on the pre-frame. But with that being said, don't pre-frame in a way that doesn't make sense to you or you hear someone say something because that will ruin your call before it even starts. Yeah. What's the quote? It's like, don't try beat, don't try beat me at being me because you'll never win. And like, it's like, I say that to my team all the time. Like we'll go through role play. And I'm like, well, I would say this, but you probably, you probably shouldn't say that because you won't say it with conviction. Maybe go down this other road. Um, I think like with where the audience are, like just to give you a bit of an understanding of the audience, most of the people that work with uh, or listen to the show uh, are in between that first six figures and hitting the 250K mark. They're in that kind of sticking point where they've done the work, right? That first six figures is mostly just workload, just do more things and you will get there. And then that next six figures is like, okay, trying to create some systems, trying to create some efficiency and mostly some predictability. Where have you found leverage within your business, a bit a bit off topic from sales, but just in business management in general that has given you some sort of efficiency or predictability through leverage? Um, it's, good. it's a really good question. I think when you look um, at your business, there's, there's a really good quote. I forget who it comes from, but it they said something along the lines of like, being a good business owner is learning how to outsource and get the same type of production or similar production so you can leverage more time and mm-hmm. then continue to build more. Um, and that's what I think a lot of business owners who get to the first six figures by just grinding, doing more like you're saying, they don't know how to leverage other people to fill them in in their roles that are taking a lot of time, like sales calls or messaging or content creation. Once I learned like, oh, dang, like I can bring someone on, pay them four grand a month and they'll do all that for me. And it takes it completely off my plate. That's where I see a lot of those business owners who get stuck with like first couple six figures because they they started making money, but now they want to hold on to it. And what Mm. you have to do to move faster is get rid of it, pay it to people who can then come on, give you back more time. And then you can keep making more money because time is money and money is time. So you're either going to pay with time either meaning like if you want to get to 10 million, but you don't bring on enough people fast enough, it'll take you 10 years mm-hmm. or you can pay more money and then you can get to 10 million in one year. And then your business will keep making that money and you'll make more in the long run. But that's the number one thing is learning how to leverage people. Flip side of that, learning how to let someone go that you're trying to leverage. Who's not doing a good job in leveraging. That's the other thing you bring on, like you said, I, I worked with my brother, right? So some people are, oh, you're lucky and stuff. But my brother, like, for, for people that don't know, it was like he would destroy me. Like, mm. I, I did, I had zero grace. So, like, we got to a point where he's like, bro, if you don't start performing when I first start, like, 
almost zero trades. He's like, dude, if you don't perform, you're gone. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if we're related. I don't care if like, you know, one eye and a peg leg. That's like, business, you know? isn't it? Hey, like that's yeah. business. Yeah. So like, I think that's something my brother taught me and I respect him a lot for it. It's like, he, he taught me like, dude, everyone's replaceable. Like you're replaceable. I'm replaceable. Like you're, everyone is. So learning how to leverage people, get more time back as a business owner. And then if someone's not performing, being willing to move fast off of them versus like, Oh, like I'm going to try to make it work, even though it's, it's not working. And that's with the sales team, fulfillment team, like anything. And that's my best business owners. That's what they do. They bring someone on They're like, Hey, I think they're going to be a great fit. The things that, you know, you can't see in an interview or whatever it may be, start coming through. And then they're like, Oh, I made a mistake. Move on. And yep. then we move to the next person. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. The, like the, like I'm a big believer now that in like higher, slow, fire, fast. And I, I've definitely learned that the hard way of just trying to give people more grace than what they're deserving of. Um, and, or what their skill set would, would suggest they should be allowed. Um, but look, I think that's uh, one of the processes of outsourcing and hiring. Like it gets to that point of like, you just need to learn when to let go. Yeah, man. It's, it's a, uh, as again, for, for like newer business owners, that's where it gets tough because, you know, I think newer business owners sometimes are like, oh, I want to be the cool boss or I want to be like <laughs> the boss that no one ever had. But what you start realizing is the reason certain bosses are the way they are is because that's, that's business. Like you were Happy. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Now what's, um, let's see if we can kind of wrap this up. If you could give some people some hard, cold and hard advice on sales, like to improve their sales cycle, uh, as fast as possible. I know that's like, you know, we're, we live in a, a world of, you know, instant, um, instantaneous sort of reward and sales aren't really like that. But if there's anything that you could give the people at home to improve upon their, their sales cycle, big or small, what would it be? Yeah. I mean, I think there might be a couple of things, but one that comes to mind is like, you're either co- closing or getting closed. There is no in between. And once you start thinking like, oh, this person's like, oh, let me think about it. I'll get back to you next week. They're, they're not like, and that's the mistake I see in beginners and advanced closers is letting people sell them on things that make you feel good. What what does not feel good is typically the thing that's right. So mm-hmm. when someone's like, oh, I'm going to think about it and get back to you, they're usually not thinking about it. It doesn't, thinking's instantaneous. So when they're saying that, it makes you feel good. But what you ultimately should want to hear is either someone saying, no, I don't like your program or yes, I'm in. Because no, I don't like your program sometimes can feel personal, but that's where a second layer of sales of not, and my second piece of advice is, removing your your personal feelings or taking your ego out of sales allows you to get to the real truth on calls and most salespeople can't do that they're attached to the sale they're attached to the business they're attached to what they're offering so once you can learn to separate yourself and the way you do that is is read a book called alter ego by todd herman that's right book absolutely the best book out there in terms of like how do you separate yourself from something that can feel so personal when you do that, sales becomes easy because now you just look at it more as, as a game, right? And mm. something that's like fun versus, you know, life and death. Sometimes that, that can feel a little bit. Yeah, definitely. To your, to your point, I think um, to wrap that up, something that I say to my team all the time, if you handle the objections and you they say they want to think about it and you ask them what they want to think about and where are they getting more information, you do all the things you need to do. Don't be afraid to ultimately just ask, are you just saying you need to think about it because you're too afraid to say no? And you'll get a no, and then you can actually attack the no for what it is. And it's that simple. Yeah. And that's just to piggyback off of that, not letting your beliefs get shaken by what someone's saying. So like, I want to think about it. We'll use that one. Think it is instantaneous. So if mm-hmm. I say, think of a red, green caterpillar, everyone just thought of that, right? Like now we all have different pictures in our mind. Our pictures might look a little different, but we all just thought about that. And so what you, you have to get so tied down on your beliefs that when someone's saying something, you can't be like, Oh, I think they're being serious. Like, I think, I think they actually are because you'll get more specific reasons of what's actually going through their head, what they're processing through. Um, when you get something like that, but yeah, wait, what you said, I like that. Right. Like, are you really thinking about it? Or are you going to say no? Yeah, it's good. It's very helpful because it just gets a hard answer, man. Um, 
Bro, thank you for coming on. Do you want to give everyone a little bit of plug where you can, where they can find you, where they can uh, look into your services and how you can help them in the future? Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was, this was a blast. I appreciate you uh, letting me like spill my guts on self because I, I love it. So yeah, guys, if, if you're interested in um, checking me out, easiest place to find me is going to be either on my Instagram and that's just Gentry Chittister. That's G-E-N-T-R-Y-C-H-I-D-E-S-T-E-R. Or you can find me on LinkedIn as well under that same name. Um, yeah, no underscores, no hashtags, just pretty straightforward, easy name. Um, yeah, and I'd love to connect with you guys. You feel free to send me a message or um, connect with me on some of my posts for sure. Amazing. Thanks for your time, Gentry. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, this has been a pleasure. Yeah, man. And pleasure's all mine. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. It's only worth it if you work for it. It's only worth it if you work for it. I won't stop till they hear me now I won't stop till I wear the crown